five. If you're following the curriculum, uh, we are on page 66 tonight. We're in the chapter five forms for a firm foundation. But here in Luke chapter six, 43 through 45 it says, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth a good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For if thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of, a, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for the evening, and we thank you for another opportunity to open up the Word of God. We thank you for this evening, and we thank you for uh, the groups that we had and the people here that are uh, representing. And Father, we, we are just so needful of your touch in our lives. But Father, we pray that you help us to yield our will to your will. And tonight, as this, as this lesson and this message is preached, that it would do uh, work in our hearts, it would penetrate the hard heart, it would help us to empty ourselves of ourselves, and Father, cleanse us from sin, Father, but also convict us where we need to be convicted. Help us to make those necessary changes so that we can be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our interactions with one another and with our interac interactions outside these doors. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we continue tonight in the five forms for a firm foundation. And so far we've studied form number one, and that is to follow. And then number two, last week we looked at focus. And we learned that whom we follow determines our destination. And also last week we looked, learned it's easier to look at others' flaws while overlooking our own flaws. We also learned that we need to stay under authority and in the training process. And tonight we're going to look at the third form. But I want to ask you, do you remember what the word form means? The word form means a mold or something that gives shape. So, whom we follow molds us. The philo uh, philosophies we follow mold us. They give shape to our Christian lives, and they either are firm, that means they're established and unyielding to pressure, or they're unfirm, and we get tossed, and tr tossed to and fro with every way imaginable. These things create a foundation upon which we build our lives. The foundation is what supports our structure. When we are in a storm, or the, or the storms of life, if we don't anchor our emotions, and if I don't anchor my philosophies in a firm foundation, then when the storm comes, and it's going to come, and test the anchor, I will find myself all over the place emotionally and spiritually. And in many cases, when it comes to addictions, deep in my addiction, which my emotional and spiritual instability directly affected whether I refused to go to the substance or I gave in to indulge in it. That's where it all, all lies. Listen, if you have a substance abuse problem, that, that is not the problem. The problem is the emotional imbalances that you have that drive you to that. Our third form tonight is fruitfulness. That's number three on page 66, fruitfulness. And I thought I was going to get down through here, and the Lord had different plans for this message. He really developed it only on the first two. We're only going to get down through two of them. And I wanted to get to letter C, but that's going to have to wait till next week. But we're looking at fruitfulness. And fruit in RU is defined the outcome or result an outcome or result. So what's the outcome or result of your life situations? I mean, what, what things are you applying? Are we applying love or joy or peace to it? Are we being long-suffering? Or are we applying frustration, worry, or being quick-tempered? In Luke here, 
in our text in verses 44, 43 and 44. It says, For a good tree bringeth forth, bringeth not forth, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Now listen to this. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For every tree, that be you and me, we're the tree. We are the tree, metaphorically. In Psalms chapter 1, let's turn there. I know we, we say it every week. We're going to come back to Luke here. But in Psalms chapter 1, I want to turn there. I want you to see this. But in Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we're going to re read down through from verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now that, that's a big question there. What are we meditating on? What do we meditate on throughout the whole evening, through the whole night? Or is it the word of God? Or is it my circumstances, my situations, and things that just didn't quite go right for me? Bible tells us not to think on those things. But verse 3, if it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, in verse 2, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's kind of prerequisite to, be, to meditate day and night on God's word. Then verse 3 will be true. Verse, verse 3 says, And he shall be like a what? A tree. There's that tree. He should be like a tree planted by what? The rivers of water. Every tree is known by his fruit. His own fruit. That, own, that word own means pertaining to self. We can tell if a tree has been well watered, right? The tree by a river, but tre the trees by a river are full and tall. Why? Because they have a good supply of water, right? A Christian is known by their fruit, their outcomes in their lives as they go through life's situations. Whether we have been in God's word or not, or whether we've taken in the water of God's word or not. We'll, we'll know that by the fruit, the outcomes of our lives. I can come to God's word and not take it in. I can decide if I take it in or not. And listen, we're, we're taking in something at all times. Some teaching, is, is, we're taking it in. It might be the word of God, it might not be the word of God. And it's coming forth as fruit in my life, what we're taking in. The outcomes in my life are a direct result of what I put in my heart. And I'm not talking about others' fruit. Others' reactions to life and situations that involve me. Listen, there's many times we... We think, well, if it wasn't for so-and-so, I wouldn't be... You, you can't do that. Amen. You cannot blame someone else for your responses to the situation. It can be a reason, but it, you can't blame. You are directly responsible for how you react to a situation. If someone come up here and punch me in the face right now, I am directly responsible for how I respond, right? I can, I can decide to turn the other cheek, or I can decide to retaliate. It's my choice. And it seems like the police would be there right when I retaliate and not see the first thing. Isn't that the way it usually works out? Okay. Well, God sees everything. But the fact of the matter, it, we have a responsibility to respond in a godly manner, no matter what. Well, you understand my situation. There's nothing new under the sun. God knows everything. 
He's waiting for us to respond in a godly manner. Listen, we have all that pertains to life and godliness right here. Everything we need is in this book. You know, I'm talking about my responses and reactions to life's situations and my trials. Because I understand life is a trial. It's very trying at times. You know why? Because we have other moral agents that are not exactly following the way that we think they should follow things. Well, my joy doesn't come from an outside source. My joy doesn't come from my children obeying. I get joy in that, but that's not where my joy comes from. My joy comes from the Lord. And as my children walk in truth, I get joy from that too. In our workbook, letter, letter A, a good man, our, our blank is good, will bring forth that which is good from the good treasure of his heart. In Matthew 5, 35, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Now, let's look at our text, Luke chapter 6, 45. It's going to... says basically the same thing. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So I want to park there for just for a moment. And we're going to look at the word treasure. See, the treasure is the place in which good and precious things are collected and laid up for future use. And that could be adult, child, it doesn't matter. We're laying things up in our, in our heart. Experiences. And, and daily infractions. People uh, upset us and do things to us. And we're laying things up. Whether we're going to be bitter against it, upset about it, or if we're going to respond in a godly manner. It's all up to us. But that phrase of the heart, that's the center and seat of our spiritual life. It's the soul or mind, as it is the fountain and seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites. And we talked about appetites. Addiction is an appetite on a binge. It's the affections, the purposes, and the endeavors. That's our heart. It's of our soul. That's our mind, will, and emotions so far as it has affected and stirred in us in a bad way or a good way. It's the seed of sensibilities. It's the seed of affections and emotions and desires and appetites. That's what's in our heart. So it's important what's in there. Because we bring forth from our hearts. That phrase, bring forth, means to send out. It also can be uh, defined to draw out with force. Storms of life. Have any of you ever been in a storm of life? I mean, just, you're just in, sometimes we seem like we're in crisis mode all the time. You know, this crisis is a life. They draw out by force deep-seated emotions. That's why it's so important what we put in. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I told you guys about, remember I told you I was lifting weights and uh, I was dealing with my dumbbells and I smashed my finger with the 70 pound dumbbell on the floor because I would bang. What I would do is I would, it, there's a screw on the end and it gets tight. So I'll bang it on the floor to break that loose. Well, guess what was between the floor and, my, and the weight? Finger. My finger. Most people will swear when that stuff happens, right? I didn't swear. It didn't even enter my mind. I thank, I thank God for that. I no longer swear in my mind. That's huge. In my early years, swearing came forward just like that. 
Spiritually developed heart, no swearing. Why? Because the word of God drove it out, and now it, the word of God, resides. So when sudden crisis comes, the Holy Spirit calls for the fruit of the Spirit, and the heart brings forth from the treasure. Right? So the question is, what's there? What is in the dark areas of your heart? Oh boy, it's getting real now, isn't it? Bring forth. That's to cause a thing to move straight on to its attendant goal. And it, the question is, is, this gonna, is it going to be a good thing? Philippians 4.8. Let's go there for a moment. We're going to come back to Luke here, but go to Philippians 4.8. If any of you have ever counseled with me before, when you're having uh, bad thoughts or stuff like that, I take you to Philippians 4.8. And I almost always take you to Philippians 4.8. Because it's good. He says, finally, brethren. And when he says finally, you should look up the verses ahead. But for the sake of time, we're not going to look at that. But finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. We're so, we're so quick to take the bad reports a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what does it tell you to do? Think on these things. It te it's telling you, think on these things. So if I'm having bad thoughts, what do I need to do? I need to stop thinking about that and start thinking about this. It's a good exercise to check out my thinking. A good thing means of a good constitution or nature. Agreeable, excellent, distinguished. Is the, thought, is the thoughts that I'm thinking, are they distinguished? Are they of a distinguishing manner? Think about that. Is it something that you would want to present to people? Like your best foot forward, so to speak? The things, now listen to this, the things drawn out from the heart will impact our lives physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Those things stored in the heart, those things thought and meditated are coming out, and if they're, if they're not good, they will embarrass us. They will humiliate us. Because they will come forth at the most inconvenient time. Ask, ask people who are sitting down in prison. Man, if I would only just thought just for a moment. I read an article some years ago on Alzheimer's patients. And they say as you get older, you start to lose your ability to um, to filter things. So if I swear or if I have really bad thoughts, guess what? That sweet little old lady or that nice little old man that you thought that I was is no longer going to be that nice little sweet little old man because the thoughts that I think are going to come out at that time. That's why you hear about people in the nursing home Nurses in the nursing home, they're getting beat up and all these things are happening because those things were in the heart before. Yep. Amen. So it's important what we think now so when we get older, those things don't come to... You follow what I'm saying? It's going to be... I mean, at that time when we're not in that state, we might not really care about it that much. But how is that going to affect my family? My dad was thinking about all these things all this time because that's what's coming out now. So having a pure heart is very important in your early years. Let's look at, look at Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verses 30, 37. 
and then we're going to look at 36. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Verse 36, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That's a hard, that's a hard verse to, to swallow. From our words, the fruit. From our words spoken, we will be justified. Justified means to be rendered, rendered righteous or condemned. Condemned is to give judgment against one or pronounce guilty. I'm not talking about our salvation, I'm talking about just being guilty. Pronounce means in the Webster to, to say or announce something in an official form, official or formal way. So my words which come forth from my heart are going to pronounce judgment of being justified or condemned. They will, my words, go before me and announce this is Dennis Stambro, and these words thought and spoken are justified. They're righteous words. Or they're going to say, this is Dennis Stambro, and these words spoken or thought pronounced Dennis Stambro guilty by the standard of God's word. Amen. That's what we measure it by. Right. My words either minister or they destroy. Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29. It says, Let cor no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You ever hear the, the phrase, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say it? How about if you have, don't have anything good to say, don't think it? I think that would be a better place to start, don't you? Sometimes our words may seem hard, especially when giving counsel, and you need to reprove or rebuke somebody. A lot of times people say, oh, you're just being mean. No, maybe sometimes that's exactly what you need to hear. The, the word of God cuts. It is still good why? The outcome is for their betterment. It depends on whether it is received or not taken in. It all comes down to the treasure in the heart, the place in which we st store things through our teachers. And who are our teachers? Our media, things we read, things we listen to good or bad. They are stored and collected for later use. So the question is, what have you collected and laid up in store for future to be used? Is it a good thing? Is it scripture? Is it, um, is it sound speech? Titus 2.8. Titus 2.8. Here the Bible says, let's look at verse 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Sound speech is an earmark of a sound heart. Or is it bad things? Corrupt speech. Corrupt speech is an earmark of a corrupt heart. It's, a, it's an earmark of a bitter heart, of an envious heart, or a covetous heart. Those outcomes, that fruit, glorify God or glorifies the God of this world. In our work, workbook, letter B. God is glorified or made to look good when we bear much fruit. John 15, 8. So 
John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. We're going to turn to a verse here in Ezekiel, and this is an exercise that I go through every once in a while to really check myself out. And something that my grandmother used to do years ago when I would come to her house, and some of you know this, when I come in the house, I would get scooped up and put in a high chair and tied in. And she would go over to the counter and she would press record on her tape recorder. And she would record half of our visit with her with my sister and I and our interaction, and then she would play it back with us, back to us the second half. And she'd say, see how you talk to your sister? Did you see how you, did you see how you spoke to her? Did you see how you directed that? Did you see how mean you were? Did you see? And she would point all these things out. Well, that was psychological torture. Number one, I didn't like hearing myself on the tape in the first place. But the fact of the matter is, that made an impact on me. So I want to, I want to read something. This is for application. But in, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 6 to 18, he said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I shall go far from thy sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in. And behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood so Jezaniah and the son of uh, Zaphan, and every man sens his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man, now listen to this, in the chambers of his imagery, his mind. For they say, the Lord seeth us, seeth us not, and the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the house, of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there was a woman weeping at Tammuz. And he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt have see greater abominations than these. And he brought me again unto the inner court of the house, Lord's house. And behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between this porch and the altar were, around, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshiped the sun towards the east. And they said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? It is, is it a light thing of the house of Judah that they commit the abomination which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have turned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal fear in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry my ears, in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Listen, what we do in the imagery of our minds, God sees everything. And my, my, my question that I, that when I read this passage, and I know the direct interpretation of it, but the application that I make to myself is when I was involved in pornography, if the Lord were to dig in the hole and open that door, what would he find? 
And I ask you the same question. If, if I were allowed to go and dig in the hole and open the door to your mind and heart, what would I see? That's very sobering to consider that. To be that open and transparent and allow... See, the Lord already does that. He goes wherever He wants to go, whether you like it or not. But the key is for us to be transparent with God so we can deal with those things Amen. in the dark areas of our hearts. Because, friends, when adversity comes, it's coming forth. You're not going to stop it. The only thing that's going to stop it is the Holy Spirit of God. Period. Nothing else. Nothing else has the power. To do. You do not possess the power to stop it. Because, God, because the devil has a perfect storm for you. And he'll brew it up. And you'll get right in the midst of it. And you know what? It's coming forth. And what are you going to do then? You got crimes of passion? That's why husband and wife, you have people that kill each other. And, and, and I've told you this before. Oh, they were the nicest person. They mowed my lawn. They did all this stuff for me. They were wonderful people. Not in that particular moment. Am I making sense? Would God be glorified if we were to display the imagery of our heart? It's a sobering thought. I mean, would we, would we welcome the searching of our hearts? Psalms 139, 23. Psalm 139, 23. Here David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Verse 24, And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's, I want to, I want to be able to pray that every day. I don't pray that every day. I don't always ask you know, God, go ahead, dig around in my heart and find those things, you know. But I should. If I really want God to change me, I need to give him free course. And I can't have compartments in my heart and say, you can do all, all you want over here, but this part, we're going to hold on. You're not touching that part. That's what we say. You can... Anything else you want, but, and God's going, I need it all. I need it all. Psalms 51. This is David again. In verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know why the car, there has to be a heart that's cr a, a clean heart created? Because our hearts are desperately wicked. That's their natural state. They're desperately wicked. We are bent to backsliding. That's our natural bend. So everything that we're doing and we're yielding to the Spirit of God, we ha it's always a battle. It's always a fight. And we learned tonight in the principle, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. My wife is not my enemy. My children are not my enemy. My boss isn't my enemy. My parents aren't my enemy. My pastor's not my enemy. And neither are any of you. You know, when I don't look at you as an enemy, the offenses get, they get lessened greatly. You know that? They get lessened greatly because you look at it through a spiritual lens. Am I making sense? Okay. So I want to make sure because everyone's looking at me like, I don't know if I'm... <laughs> I 
don't know if you're going to rush me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but listen, th- this stuff is important because it all starts in this heart. We can have a hard heart. We can have, you know, I'm, I, th- I can't remember who it was, it's what uh, books is in, but he talked about breaking up the fallow ground. You know, when, when the ground's hard, the water just runs off of it. We need to break that ground up. That's what Friday night's all about. Allowing, we talked about training the other day. It's allowing someone that's spiritual to poke holes in what you're doing. And when that happens, then exercising those things so they can get built back up again properly. How many of you ever broke an arm in here? Anybody break an arm in here before? I hear about people, I've never broken bone by the grace of God in my life. But the fact of the matter is, I've heard of people that have had them set wrong and they have to be rebroke. I don't want to be that way spiritually. I don't have to be rebroke again. I want to build right now and from here on. And I believe we have something that can help us with that. And it will it will slice and dice your life through and through. And it, it'll, it'll show you what, who you are, what you are. And you know what? And the beauty of that is we can deal with it then. Or we can put our head in the sand and say, I'm, no, I'm not going to deal with this. I, that part of my heart is not, we're not dealing with that. And you can go on years and years and years and never take care of it. But you've never grown out of your adolescence. And you could be 60, 70 years old and still acting like you're 16. Something's wrong with that. Because we're not being under training. We're not allowing the preacher the word of God or the word of God to penetrate that hard heart. So we keep coming back to the same thing, to the same thing, to the same thing, to the same thing. God's going, will you just learn the lesson? So I ask you again, what are you putting in to that heart of yours? See, there's only so much room in your heart for things. So if I start flooding it with the word of God, guess what? The devil's got to go. And I'm not, if you're here and you're saved, the devil can't reside in your heart. Only, only the Lord Jesus Christ. But those thoughts, they have to go. They have to. So Philippians 4.8 is very important that you check your thoughts out by that. You know, David said, create in who? Me. Many times we say, create create a clean heart in Brian. So I'll benefit. Right? So I can go over and poke him and do whatever I want. And, but you, you, have to, you have to respond spiritually. You have to. Because I'm expecting it. Because you're a Christian. That's what we do. But when we get poked, well, you know, it's just, I'm just a human being. And no, I, I still have a responsibility to be long suffering. I still have a responsibility to be gentle and goodness and have faith and be meek. I still, that's still my responsibility. So when life's adversity comes, when the storms come, what's coming forth? Let's turn to Job 23.10. Job 23.10. And if you want to talk about adversity, Job went through adversity. Job 23.10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's, that's what I want. Job had storms and yet came forth in the midst of the storm as gold. That's amazing. In Job 122, he says,
The Bible says, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You know, before that, he had lost family. And his wife, at one time, told him to curse God and die. But Job wouldn't do that. He said, no. Look at verse 21. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. And God gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That should be our attitude. That should be where we're at. So maybe you're in a storm right now, or maybe you're not. But I ask you, when you, what do you have your heart anchored in? What have you been putting in the heart? Because the storms of life are going to test that anchor. And you'll know if that anchor is going to hold or not. Let's bow for a word of prayer. I have a couple of questions for you tonight. These are some hard things to consider. Opening your heart. Most of the time people get hurt and they close, they close down, they close their heart, and they're not willing to, uh, to open up. But I ask you, what, what is in the storehouse of your heart? And secondly, do you need to do some, some house cleaning tonight? I'm going to have my daughter Heather come and play the piano for us. Oh, that we would come forth as gold. I hope that's your prayer tonight. And maybe, maybe you need to come to the altar and pray. Maybe you say, you're here and you say, pray for me. The images that I have stored and the words that I've laid up, that they'll be disposed of that I'll destroy them. Maybe you're here and you say, I, I just need to allow God to search and I will destroy those things that God reveals to me that need to go through his word and through counsel of leadership and through his preached word. The altar's open. You can come and pray if you like. Pray in your seat. Maybe you're listening. What, what have you stored in your heart? We have, we have a society that stores all kinds of things in their heart. And I ask you, in, in that bank, what, what's, what's there? What deposits have you made that you're going to be taking withdrawals out eventually? Now, now's the time to do business with God and to get things right so that you can have good things coming out. I'm going to ask Brother Nozinski to come close us in prayer. this is a help to you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the work that you've begun in us as born-again Christians. Lord, I pray that you'd help us and give us plenty of grace. You told us to renew our mind, uh, not, not to be conformed by this word uh, world, but be transformed. Lord, help us think on those things that are true and pure and lovely and of good report. Help us commit to memory, Philippians 4, 8, that uh, great litmus test of our thoughts. Help us be able to meditate on it and really take into captivity those thoughts that exalt themselves against your holy knowledge and to cast them down in the power of the Holy Spirit, that eventually, we, Lord, we would just bring forth that which is of good fruit. Uh, we know we cannot do it in, a, in and of ourselves. It's not by might nor by power, Father. It's by your Spirit. That's where the victory comes. And 
or we do, we want to create a burden that we want to bear much fruit. We want you to be glorified. Help us not make it about us, but make it about you. Lord, only you can change us. We are so desperately wicked, and we have such depths of iniquity in our heart. Help us really yearn for you to search us and to not hold on to things and to be open and pure and confess to you and to con, uh, just that we could live a godly life in this world. Uh, uh, there's so many people who are dying each day, and Lord, we have such a sphere of influence, each and every one of us. We can really just be a light and salt and give us the words to give the gospel to those. And Father, help us. It's so easy to get complacent, so easy to get lazy. But there's people, eternal souls are on the line. And we're here but such a short time. Help us not get allured by our work, by acquiring things, and uh, taking vacations, and, you know, spending time with grandkids and just all kinds of our children, stuff that seem good, Lord, but help us be serious about getting the gospel. Help us be serious about you. And we thank you. And we look forward to this fourth fellowship. And uh, we pray you bless the food in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that our fellowship would be sweet. But ultimately, Lord, add to our numbers. Allow us to be a place where starving Christians come for discipleship and people who are hurting emotionally and uh, using uh, bad coping mechanisms as drugs and alcohol. And Lord, we just want to see uh, those people who are downtrodden come in and just watch the miracle of you working in lives and help it start with us, each and every one of us. Help us examine ourselves and uh, help us be the example of the believers. And we thank you so much, Lord, for you and the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think we I think we have one.